Well, welcome to our webinar, The Venom Components for Therapeutics, Combating Cancer with Snake Proteins. Uh, my name is Joanne Gear, and I am the Executive Director of the Biopharma Research Council. We are an association for scientists across all the many silos of biomedical research. And you know, to us, that includes industry, academia, nonprofit, government, and suppliers, and those who love them. And we find it to be a wonderful mission to really try to stimulate uh, cross-fertilization of ideas and expertise to, in order to stimulate unlikely partnerships and collaborations across the biomedical research community. This uh, is a page that just shows you all a, a selection of the things that we did last year. As you can see, we're already into our 2016 programs and we have a few more that are going to be announced. Um, we will be doing a, uh, a virtual conference in April on point-of-care diagnostics. We'll be doing a conference in Princeton on the Internet of Medical Things in July, which looks at cybersecurity issues. Um, we will be doing a microbiome program. Looks like it's going to be in early October in New Jersey also. Uh, and then in, on October 20th this year, we're going to uh, Research Triangle Park for our fifth Triangle uh, Biotech Research Symposium, uh, which this year is going to focus on the theme you can see here, which is D3D, Data, data Drugs and Diagnostics. It's a theme that we develop uh, to really uh, try to build that cohort of uh, scientists and IT people who know how to talk to each other. And I'm just, I like this picture. We're, we're on the East Coast where we have a lot more snow than that, but uh, we, we wish everyone just the right level of winter. Today we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Frank Markland, and then during the Q&A period, Dr. Keeney and Dr. Fritzinger will be joining us. I'll introduce all three of them now, and then uh, we invite you to enter questions at any time. If you think it's a question for a particular speaker, please note it in the questions, but otherwise you can make it a general question. Um, after I introduce, Dr. Markland will take over. He will speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have a nice long Q&A. The whole session will be recorded and will be available on our website along with the slides, and it usually takes a day or two for that to happen, and you'll receive an email when it's ready. <clears throat> so to begin, uh, Dr. Francis Markland is a professor of biochemistry and molecular biology at UCLA. Um, USC. USC, I'm so sorry. Well, I'm glad I didn't mute you yet, Dr. Markland. I apologize. <laughs> U University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Thank you. He has over 55 publications, has served on numerous study sections to review grants for the National Cancer Institute. Over 15 U.S. and world patents surround his technologies. He has co-founded three startup companies and served as chairman or co-chairman of the Subcommittee on Exogenous Factors, International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis for 20 years. Dr. Keeney is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences in the National University of Singapore. He is a member of the Executive Committee of the International Society on Toxinology, has published more than 210 original research papers, reviews, and book chapters, and edited five special issues and two books on venoms and toxins. Dr. Fritzinger is uh, the uh, head of Fritzinger Biopharma Consulting. He's a seasoned molecular biologist and protein chemist working on the early stage development of protein therapeutics. He currently provides consulting services, molecular biology, protein chemistry, and biologics, biologics development. As associate professor at the University of Hawaii Cancer Center, he performs structure function studies on human complement C3, co-founded the biotech startup Encode Biopharmaceutics, which is based on the intellectual property from his laboratory. Previous to his work at University of Hawaii and ENCODE, Dr. Fritzinger was the director of DNA sequencing and genotyping core at Myriad Genetics. So thank you so much. We're going to get started now, and you can feel free to enter your questions at any time. And I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Markland. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the um, two people in my laboratory uh, listed on the first slide here, uh, Assistant Professor Steve Swenson 
and uh, Radu Mania, uh, who are responsible for the work that I'll be discussing right now. Um, so welcome everybody, I, wherever you are, either good morning or good afternoon. Um, the um, first slide, uh, the um, peptide or protein that we're studying uh, is a class called disintegrins, which originally were isolated from snake venom. And they consist of a family of disulfide-rich, extremely stable peptides that uh, are not only found in snake venom, but more recently they've been discovered in mammalian proteins, a class of proteins called the atom family members, atom standing for a disintegrin and metalloprotease. So these are multi-domain proteins which uh, are composed of a disintegrin as well as a uh, metalloprotease. The, the snake venom disintegrins bind exclusively to activated integrins on cells, and they are also derived from multi-domain proteins, um, similar to the atom family members, um, and they all contain an RGD, arginine glycine aspartic acid, or some alternative tripeptide motif, which is at the, the tip of a flexible 11 amino acid loop that is held at the at the base of the loop by two separate disulfide bonds. And this RGD loop is involved in integrin interaction. Interestingly, these disintegrins range in size from small to medium to large uh, monomeric forms, and they are also form as dimers, um, either uh, homodimer, two identical chains, or heterodimer, uh, two different chains held together by two disulfide bonds close to the amino terminus. Our original disintegrin that we purified was contortrostatin, uh, which was from southern copperhead, and uh, contortrostatin is one of the dimeric forms, and it is a homodimer um, with two identical polypeptide chains uh, held by two disulfide bonds near the amino terminus. And just to give you an idea of the complexity of the southern copperhead venom from which contortrostatin was derived, you can see um, that the predominant proteins are phospholipases uh, and also snake venom metalloproteases, and SP stands for serine proteases. So these are major components in the venom. Um, the disintegrin, which is indicated as DIS, um, is about 1 to 2 percent of the venom protein is composed of that um, disintegrin class. Um, on the left of this slide, you can see the mechanism that was used to, to, to derive this um, different portions of the venom, the composition of the, the different components of the venom, uh, first separated by HPLC, then by SDS page, uh, from which the uh, individual uh, protein or peptide bands were eluded and then uh, sequenced uh, using triptych digestion and multi uh, time of flight, time of flight mass spectra. So um, the venom is indeed a complex mixture of a number of different proteins. So we have been studying the disintegrins for over 20 years now, um, and through a specific ligation of activated integrins, contortrostatin demonstrated a strong tumor uh, growth inhibition uh, by a combination of its anti-invasive, anti-angiogenic, and anti-metastatic activities. Uh, further, like all disintegrins that are directly purified from snake venom, contortrostatin is very highly soluble, it's very stable, um, and uh, our data also suggests that it is not immunogenic and can be safely infused into laboratory animals, and we've used canines and rodents with no observable adverse effects. The target for the disintegrins are integrins, which are a family of heterodimeric transmembrane cell surface receptors that mediate interactions between the extracellular matrix and important subcellular um, systems. They form a physical link between the extracellular matrix, which is shown here in the upper part of this uh, diagram, um, and the actin cytoskeleton, shown as the green below the, um, the cell membrane here. Uh, thus, they connect the extracellular microenvironment to the migratory apparatus and ultimately by these red arrows to uh, other uh, alternate pathways to control gene expression. 
And they're involved in many physiological and pathological processes, including embryonic development, wound repair, um, motility, uh, and tumor angiogenesis, tumor growth, metastasis, and coronary artery uh, reocclusion. Importantly, their overexpression, mislocalization, and dysregulated activity uh, in cancer drives tumor progression. Therefore, they serve as attractive targets for cancer therapy, and this has been recently uh, observed, and we uh, have been taking advantage of this fact. However, there's been one problem with contortorstatin. Uh, although it's been shown to have very effective anti-tumor uh, activity in breast, prostate, ovarian cancer, and glioma animal models, the, the major problem is one that I already indicated, and that is the availability. Protein exists as a very small fraction of the total venom protein. Thus, the quantities of venom that are necessary to purify amounts of contortorstatin to treat a single patient would be uh, essentially impossible to achieve, making its, its translational development practical. Therefore, uh, the solution was to make a recombinant version of contortorstatin, um, and the, um, we've therefore developed a highly engineered bacterial uh, E. coli expression system to generate the recombinant dis disintegrant, which we call vicrostatin, and that's abbreviated VCN as opposed to CN for contortorstatin. Vicrostatin actually represents an improvement over contortorstatin. It has the same um, integrins to which it binds, the activated integrins. Furthermore, it's easier and cheaper to produce, and it's predominantly a monomer, but retains full biological activity with respect, as I indicated, to binding to the different integrins. This shows the um, procedure that we use and the chimeric protein that, that we made. So vicrostatin is, a, as I indicated, a single polypeptide chain. It's made as a chimeric recombinant disintegrant, which has been rationally designed and engineered from the native venom-derived disintegrant contortorstatin with the preserved RGD disintegrant fold at the tip of the amino, uh, 11 amino acid loop. The structure of contortorstatin is shown in red which has 186 base pairs, or 62 amino acids. There is a tobacco etch virus cleavage site that separates contortorstatin from the chimera that's been made with thyrodoxin in the uh, origami B E. coli expression system, which also carries double mutation in thyrodoxin reductase and glutathione reductase pathways, um, making the bacteria uh, more oxidative environment to facilitate the disulfide bond formation. Um, the design of vicrostatin improved the affinity for integrin alpha 5 beta 1 by inserting a uh, C-terminal tail uh, from another uh, viper disintegrant, echistatin, which replaces the C-terminus of contortorstatin. We'll see this a little better in one of the uh, subsequent slides. But you can see that there's six amino acids at the carboxy terminus from echistatin. Um, and I indicated there's a tobacco etch virus cleavage site uh, to separate um, vicrostatin from the um, thyrodoxin. Uh, and at that cleavage site, there's an additional amino acid left at the amino terminus, which is a glycine. Vicrostatin binds to integrins producing anti-tumor, anti-invasive, and anti-angiogenic activities, essentially identical to contortorstatin, and it's an excellent drug candidate due to its manufacturability, its extremely high solubility and stability, and it can be safely administered with no evidence of toxicity um, or immunogenicity, similar to contortorstatin. Um, here we see the sequence of vicrostatin, the 69 amino acids, the underlying amino acids, the glycine here comes from the tobacco etch virus protease cleavage site, the carboxy terminal 6 amino acids re from echistatin replace the 3 amino acids from contortorstatin, which are phenylalanine, histidine, and alanine replaced by these six amino acids from echistatin, and the, that was engineered into the structure to improve the binding affinity for alpha-5, beta-1. So in terms of the molecular weight is about seven kilodaltons, and the, the binding, 
the integrands alpha v beta 3, alpha v beta 5, alpha 5 beta 1, and alpha 2 b beta 3, the fibrinogen receptor on platelets, uh, is the same as contortorstatin. So <clears throat> in the separation or the isolation of the um, vicarostatin from the bacterial cell lysate, it was produced as a thyroid thyroidoxin vicarostatin infusion protein. This was cleaved by tobacco H virus protease and in lane 3 we see the thyroidoxin separated from vicarostatin. Then further purification steps we produce the pure vicarostatin which as I indicated is a monomer. This is the modeling of the structure. You see that the carboxy terminus here although in blue is not very well shown here but it comes back in close proximity to the RGD loop shown here in yellow um, and forms a conformational epitope that improves the binding affinity to specifically alpha 5 beta 1. And we see uh, in this slide the comparison of the binding affinities for vicarostatin versus contortorstatin to alpha v beta 3, 6 nanomolar, 7.4 nanomolar, so essentially identical. The slight drop off in binding affinity of vicarostatin versus alpha v beta 5. But for alpha 5 beta 1, we see there's about a 13 fold increased affinity by incorporating that alteration at the carboxy terminus of uh, vicarostatin to improve the binding affinity for um, alpha 5 beta 1. And all three of these integrins are very important in both tumor progression, i.e. migration, invasion, and the process of angiogenesis, uh, tumor angiogenesis. The first study that we did with the, the vicarostatin was to compare its inhibition um, uh, of platelet aggregation uh, by its ability to bind to integrin alpha 2b beta 3, the activated form of the integrin which is found uh, high level on platelets and we found that uh, vicarostatin shown in red has essentially identical inhibitory activity to the uh, homodimeric peptide contortorstatin. So this is the first evidence that we had that the recombinant peptide vicarostatin uh, was uh, identical in biological activity to contortorstatin. Uh, this was then subsequently confirmed by additional studies uh, such as this, which shows the um, effect of vicarostatin on the actin cytoskeleton shown here in red staining with uh, rhodamine phylloidin and the hex stain for nuclei shown in blue. We see here the normal actin cytoskeleton, the stress fibers in these cells and obviously there are five different cells shown here. Uh, when treated with cytochalase in D, which is a known um, inhibitor of the actin cytoskeleton, we see the actin cytoskeleton is disrupted. When we treat for a couple hours with vicarostatin at 100 nanomolar, we also see complete disruption of the normal actin cytoskeleton. So we feel that this is the mechanism by which the disintegrant acts to inhibit the migratory phenomenon, the cell migration uh, which the tumor cells are using during their invasion and ultimate metastasis to some remote site. Um, <clears throat> to show that vicarostatin is not cytotoxic, we um, used some multi-well chamber slides uh, which were um, coated with matrigel. The different uh, cells were then grown on the matrigel, either HUVEX shown in red, MDA MB231 or MDA MB435, which are both breast cancer cell lines, although there's some controversy um, about the, the origin of the 435, whether it's a melanoma or, or breast cancer. Nonetheless, uh, all three of these uh, cell lines when treated with one micromolar contortorstatin or vicarostatin show no uh, increase in cell death versus the untreated cells shown here as a control. So this supports our feeling, although much more work has to be done in this regard to confirm uh, the uh, lack of toxicity of contortorstatin or vicarostatin now. So we have this activation, but how do we deliver it to the tumor? In the early studies uh, with breast cancer, the tumor cells were injected into the mammary fat pads and contortorstatin back in those days was delivered by daily intratumor injection. 
Obviously, this is not a clinically relevant method of delivery if the tumor cells uh, spread to remote sites. So we needed to develop a more effective delivery modality, and that was uh, via the formation of a nanosome drug formulation or liposomes. And we see here the schematic of how this happened uh, by mixing vicostatin with the dried lipids in a um, flask. The, uh, and then either uh, homogenizing or uh, using a sonication uh, me me method to form the liposomes. The, the, the disintegrin was encapsulated in this um, sphere of the phospholipids. And we see on the right um, the therapeutic protein vicrostatin encapsulated inside of the liposomes. So we use this. I'll give you one example of um, the liposomal formulation effectiveness. Um, <clears throat> it's, um, the, the beauty of this is that we're able to achieve an encapsulation efficiency of about 70 to 75 percent. And the long half-life in blood allows leakage through the gaps between the cells lining the angiogenic vessels in the tumors, the endothelial cells, uh, the so-called leaky um, uh, endothelium uh, in the tumors of this angiogenic vessels allows these liposomes to leak out. The liposomes are about 100 nanometers in diameter. The advantage of liposome-mediated drug delivery include reduction of possible side effects due to this targeted delivery, shielding of immunogenic drugs from immune recognition, um, possible decrease in dosing frequency, and it facilitates delivery of drugs with short circulatory half-life, such as vicrostatin, which has a half-life of 4.6 hours as the naked protein, whereas the liposomal formulation has a half-life of about 25 hours. And as I indicated, it delivers vicrostatin to the tumor via this passive accumulation due to the leaky uh, angiogenic vasculature in the tumor. This is the example that I wanted to show you. This is a CWR22 prostate cancer bone metastasis model in which we drilled a hole in the uh, tibia um, and uh, injected on one side, one tibia of the mouse, um, tumor cells on the other side. We just injected saline, and then we followed the increase in tumor size by measuring the diameter of the uh, tibias um, as time progressed and get a plot like this. So as controls, we had naked vicrostatin shown in green, phosphate buffered saline, or le empty liposomes, uh, which showed tumor growth um, unabated, whereas when treated with liposomal formulation of vicrostatin, there's a dramatic inhibition of tumor growth during this five-week uh, course of treatment. However, our uh, real interest now has shifted to ovarian cancer, and to put this into perspective, worldwide there are about 230,000 new cases each year with about 140,000 deaths. The majority of the cases of ovarian cancer, ovarian cancer are diagnosed at advanced stage, unfortunately, and women with distance disease, the five-year survival rate is a very abysmal 27%. The treatment of advanced ovarian cancer involves first debulking surgery to remove intraperitoneal metastases greater than one centimeter, which is then followed by chemotherapy with either platinum-based agents or, or, and or taxanes. However, there is a significant survival benefit which was reported by the NIH for surgically debulked stage 3 patients which were then treated with intraperitoneal chemotherapy. So that the adding of intraperitoneal chemotherapy to the intravenous chemotherapy produced a significantly longer progression-free and overall survival. So, <clears throat> however, the intraperitoneal uh, therapy Clinical use has been limited by the toxicity of the agents that are presently used, i.e. the platinum-based or the taxanes, uh, and the use of an indwelling catheter. And net result of this is that there's a lack of patient compliance and or patient withdrawal from the trials, despite this improved benefit. And the, a couple of interesting points that should be made at this particular time are that the uh, ovarian cancer cells are carried in the peritoneal fluid to secondary sites in the abdominal cavity and they create intraperitoneal micrometastases in the submesothelium. 
and these ovarian cancer cells are not accessible for surgical removal and are associated and responsible for the poor therapy, re therapy results and the recurrence of the ovarian cancer. So our hypothesis was that localized intraperitoneal chemotherapy could target these cells and be effective in preventing recurrence. Uh, and this occurs due to the much higher dose density that can be achieved via the intraperitoneal delivery route. In fact, the um, National Cancer Institute went so far as to recommend that the clinical community consider intraperitoneal chemotherapy for patients with advanced ovarian cancer after surgical debulking. And in fact, we have a number of colleagues who are using intraperitoneal uh, chemotherapy and are very, um, uh, very convinced that this is an appropriate and effective form of therapy. And this is uh, the way that we have uh, used our delivery. <clears throat> for vicrostatin. So we, we used a uh, viscoelastic gel called Oxyplex, which is a gel composed of polyethylene oxide and uh, carboxymethylcellulose, which is stabilized by calcium chloride. Um, it can be impregnated with vicrostatin, injected intraperitoneally, and then slowly it degrades with the release of vicrostatin. Oxyplex, unfortunately, is not approved for use in, in the United States, but is approved for use in, in Europe, parts of Asia, and Australia for prevention of post-surgical adhesions. Um, this carboxymethylcellulose serves as a tissue adherent and acts as a barrier, while the polyethylene oxide coats the surface and inhibits deposition of proteins on the tissue surfaces Therefore, with fibrin and the fibrin gel matrix form fibrin bridges, uh, they interconnect surfaces, and this leads to the adhesions that complicate uh, gynecological and other forms of surgery. But this process is blocked by polyethylene oxide, which is, as indicated here, a component of the um, oxyplex. Furthermore, Oxyplex has a high viscosity. It remains at the site of injury, promoting wound healing and inhibiting fibrosis while releasing vicrostatin. So what we envision for the clinical application would be that the uh, peritoneal surface after debulking surgery would be painted with the vic vicrostatin Oxyplex uh, and then used in combination with uh, standard of care at uh, hopefully reduced doses with uh, very effective uh, results. Uh, this shows um, our studies with I, uh, radioiodinated vicrostatin. We followed the release of soluble vicrostatin uh, in a test tube sort of an experiment. This is the day of treatment, um, no, the day since um, putting the vicrostatin oxyplex complex in the saline solution um, and measuring the release. This is the relative percent of vicrostatin released over time out to 12 days. There is an initially a fairly rapid release and then a, a fairly linear release over 10 to 12 days with about 55 to 60 percent of the vicrostatin being released during that time span. <clears throat> so. The in vivo model that we use for uh, Oxyplex uh, delivery of vicrostatin, we use the SCOV3 ovarian cancer cells. Um, two million cells were delivered via intraperitoneal injection. This um, SCOV3 um, line is a human ovarian cancer cell line, which is integrin alpha V beta 3, alpha V beta 5, and alpha 5 beta 1 positive. You notice here this. LUC stands for luciferase uh, infected cells. So the cells are infected with luciferase, uh, which gives us um, a mechanism to follow um, cells using luminescence imaging to monitor tumor growth. Uh, the ovarian cancer cells were allowed to implant and grow for two weeks, or in some cases, four days. Mice displayed slightly enlarged abdomens, and then treatment with the oxyplex gel encapsulated with, uh, which had vicrostatin encapsulated in it, or just the uh, empty gel um, by intraperitoneal injection weekly. And mice were sacrificed as the abdominal distension became significant, and then necropsy of animals uh, was used as well as luminescent imaging to gauge the extent of tumor. Here we see the oxyplex alone animals. Um, we have two mice. Uh, 
<clears throat> the group actually had contained three mice per group. Um, this is at two weeks. The red shows a high intensity of luminescent imaging. This is at four weeks. You see the extensive dissension, um, distension of the, uh, the, the belly of the mice. These little wheels here are due to the fact that we had to use um, large bore needles to inject the fairly viscous oxyplex complex. And you can see the extensive tumor dissemination throughout the peritoneal cavity in these mice at the four weeks of time. Now keep this in, image in mind as we go to this image. This is after four weeks, two weeks or four weeks treatment with the uh, vicarostatin oxyplex. Um, then you see um, again, the same wheels, we had to use the same needles, but when we opened the animals, um, first of all, there was no bleeding, internal bleeding, which was reassuring, and secondly, there was um, no visible tumor that could be uh, observed when we uh, opened the mice. Um, <clears throat> there has been uh, much interest in the use of ovarian spheroid, spheroids um, and it's believed that in the clinical setting, the spheroids are involved in ovarian cancer implantation and invasion, thus the, making their study of clinical relevance. So we form spheroids by um, letting them grow on a, on a polyhema methacrylate the derivative uh, in the, the uh, six well plates that we used. Uh, this methacrylate prevents um, the attachment to the surface. Um, we then took the cells, two times ten of the six cells uh, were then injected. Uh, they were allowed to implant and grow for four days in the animals um, and then the treatment with uh, VCN oxyplex or the saline solution of vicarostatin was initiated via intraperitoneal uh, introduction using five milligrams of vicarostatin per week. Mice were sacrificed as the abdominal distension became significant and then necropsy of animals plus luminescent imaging. Here we see the control group at two weeks, four weeks you can see ex extensive and, and further growth at four weeks of the tumor um, whereas if either VCN saline or VCN oxyplex showed minimal growth via luminescent imaging. Uh, when we opened the animals again there was extensive carcinomatosis, a dissemination of the tumor throughout the peritoneal cavity, whereas either in the vicarostatin saline or the vicarostatin oxyplex there was no visible tumor uh, that was observed. Uh, and this was um, after a four weeks treatment with once weekly uh, delivery of um, either the saline formulation or the oxyplex formulation of vicarostatin in which five milligrams per milliliter um, <clears throat> was used with a one milliliter injection or five milligrams of vicarostatin in both cases versus oxyplex alone. <clears throat> Here we see a, uh, we use a group of ten animals. This shows a representative uh, group of five of the animals of the group of ten uh, comparing the um, intraperitoneal delivery of vicarostatin saline or vicarostatin oxyplex versus the control treated with oxyplex alone. These are five representative animals from the group of ten, all of which looked very similar um, to that. So in conclusion, uh, vicarostatin is um, easily produced in sufficient quantities for clinical use. It binds specifically to only to activated integrins, uh, alpha V beta 3, alpha V beta 5, alpha 5 beta 1, and the platelet fibrinogen receptor alpha 2B beta 3. Vicarostatin is non-toxic. It targets, as I indicated, only activated integrins in remodeling or motile cells such as tumors or angiogenic vasculature uh, growing into the tumor. Uh, vicarostatin may have an advantage as an anti-cancer agent because of its powerful anti-invasive, i.e. and anti-metastatic activity. The structure of vicarostatin combined is not only the RGD motif plus other amino acids in the RGD loop with the carboxyterminal tail, which as I indicated forms a conformational epitope uh, with the RGD loop which enhances integrin binding. Vicarostatin shows excellent anti-tumor activity in, in a number of different animals, uh, models of uh, human cancer, and particularly from our perspective in 
human ovarian cancer. Uh, it has no detectable immunogenicity. It can be infused into laboratory animals with no observable adverse effects and has, we feel, significant potential for clinical translation. And I must add in closing that uh, both uh, Drs. Mania and Swenson and myself are co-founders of a company called Disintegrin Therapeutics, Inc., which is a startup company aimed at developing disintegrin-based therapeutic and diagnostic solutions. We have no financial involvement with the company, nor do we, do we serve on any of the company boards. Thank you very much. Are there well, any thank you. questions? Yes, thank you, Dr. Marklin. There are quite a few questions. That's fantastic. Um, I'd like to um, just allow uh, Dr. Keeney to, and Dr. Fritzinger to just introduce yourselves uh, so people hear your voice. Dr. Keeney, would you just like to say hello first, please? Oh, uh, hi. Uh, this is Kinney uh, in the middle of the night, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, it was a wonderful uh, talk by Frank Markland, and uh, once the, your audience has some questions, I would also have a couple of questions to Frank. Beautiful. And Dr. Fritzinger, would you like to say hello so people hear oh, your voice? Yeah. This is Dave Fritzinger. Um, again, I, I think it was a very interesting seminar, and I'm anxious to find out where this is going, going to go. Beautiful. Well, let's go ahead. We have a several questions from our audience. Let's go look at those first. Um, here's one. Why do you think copperhead snakes make such disintegrants? Am I saying this? It seems these toxins would not kill prey rapidly. Um, well, this is, as indicated by that one of the early slides, one of a number of different uh, proteins in the snake venom. Uh, in terms of why the disintegrins are there, we feel that it may be to help keep the blood fluid by virtue of its ability to inhibit platelet aggregation, i.e. preventing blood from coagulating in the body, uh, keeping the blood fluid to an allow the more damaging venom components to spread throughout the body and rapidly immobilize the prey so that the snake could then eat it as it's at its leisure. Great. Um, next question. Um, any t is there any toxicity in uh, toxicity, sorry, is there any toxicity in non-tumor cells? I think you may have kind of addressed this, but would you like to discuss it further? Yeah, so we've, we've looked at toxicity in both rat and mouse models um, and enlisted the help of a company to do some of the assays for us and all the studies that we've done show that there is no toxicity to normal cells in living organisms, either rat or mice. Um, and basically, obviously, uh, to go to the FDA to try and get approval as a new biologic, we need to do a lot more extensive toxicity studies, but we have shown that it has no effect on um, <clears throat> on any of the blood coagulation proteins um, or in, in impacting the uh, thrombin, the prothrombin time or the partial thromboplastin time. Uh, we've looked at tissue sections um, from different organs to show that the tissues treated either with the oxyplex vicarstatin or saline vicarstatin, there seems to be no uh, effect on the tissues in terms of damaging the tissues. So all the studies that we've done indicate that um, there is no toxicity associated with this protein that we are able to determine. Obviously, this needs to go to some contract research organization. We have several in mind that are appropriate. Uh, to evaluate in greater, much greater detail uh, with, you know, FDA-approved protocols to look for toxicity. Now, one question I neglected, or in the first question, I neglected to mention that these disintegrins are widely distributed throughout uh, the snake kingdom, and they are found in many, many different snakes. Um, so th th this is not unique to the southern copperhead uh, venom. Thanks. Well, I had a question, uh, Frank. Uh, yeah. By any chance, have you looked at the therapeutic window? In the sense, uh, have you looked at uh, increasing doses on normal cells, either uh, in isolation cell culture or in the whole animal? Have you tried to go 
10 times higher or 100 times higher than the effective dose. Yeah, we, we've done that when we tried to look for uh, antibodies. So we injected um, intravenously uh, very high levels of the protein, um, milligram quantities of the protein intravenously looking for an immune response. Uh, not only did we not find any immune response, hence our labeling this as non-immunogenic, but nor did we see any uh, untoward effects in any of the cells uh, that <clears throat> may have leaked out into. So um, basically all the evidence that we've accumulated thus far indicates that it has very low level of toxicity and of immunogenicity. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, I have a question. Um, what do you think the dose would be for, uh, you know, for a human? Well, the, <clears throat> we've tried to do some calculations based on the size of rodents to humans, and we've calculated that we we need um, uh, maybe 100 milligrams or something in that ballpark. Um, but obviously, in the phase one trial, we'd have to look at a dose escalation study to further pin that down. So we're just using extrapolations of some formula that are available to try and make that sort of a calculation. But it would be in the 100 milligrams. We are able to produce the, the protein. Um, we, we can make about 200 milligrams per liter in our unrefined uh, lab uh, <coughs> Uh, recombinant production capability in, in four liter flasks. So uh, I think when the the procedure is uh, refined, the, the yield can be much higher than that. Suffice it to say that we can make ample protein uh, for clinical trials just with our lab production scale procedures, but with a uh, CRO, and, and again, we've been in communication with several uh, take over the, the production, uh, they can uh, ramp up the production and, and perhaps get signif significantly more than the 200 milligrams per liter that we're achieving at the present time. Frank, uh, a continuation on the same topic is you kind of mentioned with the oxyplex uh, studies, you could paint the interior of the interperitoneal cavity. Right. Well, when you do that, would you need to have very high dose? Because when you're painting it, it probably may not be needed so much. You know, in the uh, mouse animal uh, uh, mouse studies, you had to inject them rather than paint them inside. Right. We're actually going to try the studies in mice. So we have now some. Um, OBGYN surgeons who are on our team, uh, and we will use rats and grow uh, grow the tumor first, and then resect the tumor surgically, uh, yeah. and then go in with a essentially essentially a miniature paintbrush and uh, try and paint either the saline solution or distribute the oxyplex formulation, which is fairly viscous and not as easy to work with um, around the peritoneal cavity um, and then sew the animal up and look at recurrence. This is a study that is is planned and then we've just recently been able to recruit the surgeons to help us with this study. So that's certainly something that we're very interested in doing. Yeah, perfect, thank you. I'd like to Where? Go, do, do you mind if I go to a question from one of our audience members, please? Um, yes. We've got some great questions here. Um, has anyone tried to make a small molecule mimic that has the same properties but can be made in volume or made as a biologic through a modified organism? Uh, could you repeat that, please? I missed part of it. Sure. sure. Has anyone tried to make a small molecule mimic that has the oh, same okay. properties but can be yeah. made in volume? Yeah. Has, okay. Right. I mean, there are a number of companies that, that are making RGD mimetics, that some of which have been used clinically in the hematological um, arena. Um, and there is a, a drug known as selengetide that is being used for glioma, which is um, based on an RGD 
uh, type cyclic RGD type of motif. So yes, in answer to your question, this has been done um, by a number of drug companies uh, with various degrees of success. Um, the, the problem is with using a small mimetic, um, the fact of the matter is that the disintegrin um, folds in such a way that, as I indicated, the carboxy terminal tail comes into play in improving the affinity uh, for disintegrins, and I think we sort of proved that with our studies where we substituted the carboxy terminus um, of vicarstatin, of contortorstatin, with the, the sequence of echistatin, uh, which at the carboxy terminus, as the tail folded back in close proximity to the RGD site, the affinity for alpha-5, beta-1 improved by 13-fold. So none of the drug companies have done that sort of engineering and trying to make a small molecule. They focus entirely on the RGD sequence, and in fact, in the disintegrins, there are other portions of the molecule that come into play that make it a rather difficult uh, procedure to encompass these different regions uh, into one molecule, and, and so far that has not uh, been attempted to my knowledge. Thank you. I'm sorry, David, to interrupt you there. Did you have a question or comment? Yes. Um, I was wondering where, uh, how the Octoplex stands in, in the FDA approval process. Where we stand in the FDA approval process? Yeah. No, that's, for the, for the that's gel. a great question. That's I wish I could say we were approved by the FDA, but no, we're very much in the early stages still. Um, we need to do the, the PK talk studies by some CRO. We need to demonstrate by collaborating with some CRO that we can manufacture the protein on Frank, large scale commercially. Frank, Frank. Um, and so, we, yeah. Uh, uh, actually, he was asking about the Oxyplex, not the oh, Oxyplex. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Oxyplex uh, is, has been resubmitted to the FDA for approval in the United States. Um, and so we will wait and see how that process plays out. Uh, if it doesn't play out, we can use the saline formulation of vicarstatin as an alternative or look for other similar uh, types of compounds that might uh, be appropriate uh, for use in the ovarian cancer setting. Um, we have another good question here from our audience member. Um, if you look at the effects at a VCN on immune cells specifically, is there an effect on immune cell migration? We have not done that study. That's a very good question and, and something that uh, should be done um, and uh, is something that we need to do in, in the future, but uh, has not been done at present. Um, let's see, is there perhaps something else these peptides hit that is more acutely toxic? That was an early, that was an early question in your process there. Would, would you repeat that? Sure, is there perhaps something else these peptides hit that is more acutely toxic? Something that they hit that is more toxic? Yes. Um, I don't know what you mean by hit. Okay, I'm sorry. I think I may have lost the context here. Let's see. Let's see. This was the person who asked about the copperhead snakes. Is it the? Okay, so remember we talked about the the copperhead venom, and you discussed uh, the impact the impact on on uh, coagulation. And yeah. I think that right. So this was a follow up to that question. I'm sorry, I took this out of order. So I think they're asking, is there something more toxic? But I think you may have answered it because of the coagulation. Your coagulation response may have been the, the answer to that question. Right. OK. OK. Dr. Keeney? Oops, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I I have, a, uh, you no, have another I'm question? Okay. That's OK. I have some more questions, but you go ahead. We have, yeah. we have uh, lots uh, more time. Frank, uh, yeah, Frank, I was uh, uh, wondering. Uh, you did show cytotoxicity uh, in 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 uh, cell culture system, where you had uh, you looked for the cell viability with vicrostatin and contractostatin, and uh, since these molecules affect the binding to extracellular matrix, do they kind of uh, dislodge the 
cells from binding to ECM? Or, uh, yeah. Yes, they certainly can. That's a good point. Um, yeah. So you have to be careful the extracellular matrix you choose. And we chose um, matrigel, which is basically a laminin um, component of the extracellular matrix. And vicrostatin or the RGD type disintegrants do not disrupt binding to laminin. So the effect then is does not based on a uh, disruption of the binding to the extracellular matrix protein, but due to an effect on the cell per se. Okay, um, yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah. All right, we have another uh, question from our audience member. More than 50 years have passed since the discovery of toxin from many animals, including marine snails, snakes, and other. Venom toxins are known to block certain ion channels, stopping communication of the nervous system, causing paralysis. It is well known that venom toxins comprise a cocktail of peptides of about, I'm oh, sorry, I've lost my, yeah, there we go, of about 30 to 60 amino acids. Many papers in the literature talk about the use of venom toxins in biotech and medical applications, including their potential as therapeutic given their positive outcomes against cancer and other diseases. However, many of the things presented here show the same problem found by others in regarding, sorry, I lose my, there we go, my cursor, uh, uh, found by others regarding delivery toxicity and so on. So here's the question. Why is, do, do you think that this recombinant molecule is useful as a therapeutic? So far, none has ever been developed and approved as a therapeutic for cancer, in spite of the hundreds of published papers and patents suggesting such applications for many other states. Well, first of all, this, this is a completely different molecule than all the so-called toxic components from venom. This we've shown in all our studies is not cytotoxic to your cells. So it's different than all of the so-called quote unquote venom toxins that are in a completely different class of molecule than the disintegrant family. And the disintegrants in, in general are, have many attributes that make them very useful as a biologic for uh, clinical application. First of all, they're extremely stable, they're extremely soluble. So, for instance, for ovarian cancer, presently, due to the insolubility of the drugs that are being used, the platinum compounds, the taxanes, they have to deliver literally liters of these compounds into the peritoneal cavity of women who are fighting this dreadful disease, making them much less interested or uh, willing to go through these dreadful uh, side effects related to the use of these massive volumes of components because of the extremely high solubility, over 100 milligrams per milliliter of these, at least of our recombinant uh, disintegrant, uh, we can get by with much, much smaller volumes uh, to treat the patients, among other things. And, and the, the so-called venom toxins are that have been recruited and purified and studied from many different species of snakes, completely different molecules than the snake venom disintegrants, which all of our studies uh, indicate in, in dogs, in mice, uh, in rats, in rabbits, indicate are not cytotoxic to normal human cells. Obviously, before we can get this approved by the FDA, we have to show that this toxicity is not present by some unbiased contract research organization, and that's what we're proposing to do if we can raise the funding to do that. Okay. Uh, may, may I add a few things to that, Joanne? Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, in, in, in the industry, traditionally, uh, small molecules are the main target or main uh, focus of the biopharma industry, and there is obviously Lipinski's rules and things like that. Only in the recent past, people have been trying to use biologics. And even in biologics, the main focus over the years have been uh, trying to make monoclonal antibodies, uh, particularly humanized uh, antibodies. And they have been kind of the uh, talk of the day, if you may. Uh, that they have been used uh, to treat many different diseases. 
in from toxins to therapeutics, there are a couple of issues which have to be kind of looked at. One is to identify the functional site. As uh, Frank uh, has shown, that not only RGD loop, there is also this C-terminal tail, which makes an important contact with the integrants. So such understanding would help in designing better, smaller versions of these uh, biologics, which would be probably easily feasible to be developed. So this is actually a kind of a mental block or initial block you need to uh, overcome in terms of making larger toxins into smaller versions of it and the VCs and other uh, uh, players in this field need to look at it a little more carefully in terms of uh, uh, developing uh, shorter versions or uh, uh, more amenable versions of the molecule which could be used. Thank you. Beautiful. I'm going to, I have one more question from our audience and then we'll uh, allow a little bit more time for discussion. Um, have you looked at any interesting unconventional therapeutic targets beyond the traditional venomish, in quotes, connections that are usually made with such substance, substances, i.e. Can, cell killing, cancer, neurotox, pain, etc.? You looked at any interesting unconventional therapeutic targets beyond traditional venomish connect, connections? Um, no, I guess our, our focus has been on cancer and we've looked at breast cancer, ovarian cancer, um, melanoma, uh, prostate cancer, glioma, and so our, our focus is to try and develop these agents as, as anti-cancer agents for a number of different solid tumors. And so, in answer to that question, I guess the answer is that that, that, that has been our focus and basically all that we've uh, been looking at. I don't know if that really I mean, answers. Yeah. The yeah, it or. does answer, but uh, I, I think uh, you normally look for uh, the source based either on the uh, traditional use of some plants or animal products in uh, treating certain diseases are uh, in the case of venoms and toxins uh, you look at uh, the symptoms uh, they induce in the prey which kind of is indicative of uh, which diseases you could target obviously there will be some others hidden behind the scene so in such case there is uh, screening technologies which people would use to see whether they could find uh, potentially interesting molecules which are useful in designing and developing drugs. Say for example, uh, venoms and drugs from snakes particularly target uh, neuromuscular junction so they would be useful for neurological disorders and cardiovascular systems. These will be useful for a number of these things. Uh, treating cardiovascular diseases. So that's how uh, most of these things work. And that's the way people look for specific uh, uh, drug molecules from a source. I think the, that's the reason why we focus on only neuromuscular, cardiovascular, cancer kind of uh, treatment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Fritzinger, do you have any sort of concluding comments or additional questions you'd like to address? Um, not really. I think you know. I think the whole uh, subject of using venom components as therapeutics is very interesting, which is why I've been working on it. And um, you know, I think like molecules from unexpected places or proteins from unexpected places, I think, will could play a large role in future therapeutics. Beautiful. Dr. Keeney, someone, someone's trying to reach me, but I'm not going to answer right now. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Keeney, do you have a, a, a final comment you'd like to make? And then Dr. Mark Linola, you have the final, final word. Uh, Dr. I'm Keeney. In, uh, yeah, thank you. And um, the venoms and toxins have evolved millions of years, and the, their subtype selectivity 
that's uh, identified by Frank's work uh, described today are extremely selective towards specific integrins in this case. And this uh, such selectivity and specificity are actually critical in understanding uh, um, that selectivity would help in designing better drugs so that they would have uh, quite low um, toxicity. And I think that is what we are trying, trying to understand and use that in developing specific drugs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Keeney, and for really chairing this series. You've brought us really fantastic content. Dr. Marklin, do you have any final comments that you'd like to share before we say goodbye? No, I appreciate the questions and comments from everybody, and obviously we're very interested in moving this drug forward into the clinic, and uh, our, our focus will be ovarian cancer, which is a devastating disease for for women because it's normally detected at an advanced stage where the uh, there are no really effective therapeutics. Um, so our preliminary studies here, and that's what they are because we're in mice, suggest that this might be efficacious for a treatment of the human disease, and that's uh, ultimately where we hope to go, uh, pending our uh, ability to get the funding necessary to do the studies that we need to get to that stage. So uh, again, I thank you for the opportunity to present our work and I appreciate the uh, questions from the audience and members of the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Marklin, Dr. Keeney, Dr. Fritzinger. Thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you for your questions and comments. Um, we didn't get to all of them. I'll be sharing them with our panelists. Um, and in, within a couple of days, you'll receive an email with the recording, a link to the recording and the slides. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely afternoon, evening, middle of the night, whatever it is where you are today. Take care.